so strong is light speed here in Masayuki, the unique skill almost as strong as an ultimate. I would have loved to see Chosen One go against Raphael and, you know, the just armament, just like an armory of ultimate skills that we have. And I don't think a unique skill can trump an ultimate skill and that, you know, outcome never happened because Masayuki just gave up to Gopta. But hey, let's see what any news has to say. Who is the light speed hero Masayuki? Well, with Kazuma's luck, Ainz's charm and Shadow's level of things just working out for him, He's pretty much your standard isekai protagonist, just in another person's story. A forced hero who now finds himself wrapped in events he can't even control anymore. The whole concept is actually pretty interesting, especially when we get to see just how broken his chosen one skill really is. I do love the concept. I've always loved characters like King from One Punch Man or Buggy D Clown or Usopp from One Piece where they're a bunch of frauds. But somehow through luck or charisma and a combination of other bullshit factors, they just seem to get away with it. And something, is that always, something about that is always so funny, especially in the face of just godlike beings like Rimuru and everyone else in this world, and you see Masayuki getting away with it. What I do hate is his lackeys, though. I hate how just cocky and just disrespectful his lackeys are, the look that they have. Masayuki is perfectly fine. But the people he has around them are so fucking obnoxious, and it makes sense, right? Masayuki himself won't get into trouble, but having the lackeys kind of go around talking shit and being disrespectful causes scenarios where Masayuki then can pop off. Especially when we get to see just how broken his chosen one skill really is. So as we dive into that and the details of his past, we'll also start some of the cut content from the tournament. Hmm. What was that? Details of his past. Hmm. Primordial Blue? What's going on here? We'll also start some of the cut content from the tournament. Everything from why some of his other subordinates didn't participate, all the way to the newly established Elite Four. Let's get started. I hear Elite Four is a poor translation though. It's like the Four Heavenly Kings, right? It wasn't until after Hinata had tied with Rimuru that Masayuki was now being lauded as the strongest man in the Western nations. It was as if humanity all at once shifted their faith from her to him. Likely a result of her not being perceived as all-powerful anymore. Really? People keep up on Hinata, even though she was basically there at the Tempest Festival. The public perception is, Hinata is a fraud, we need Masayuki to save us from the demons. <laughs> this in turn bolstered Masayuki's <laughs> reputation, then fully solidified it upon the news of Orthrus's destruction. His part in that, amongst a myriad of other things, led to him being known as the hero. Clout. A title he had absolutely zero part in working towards, yet still somehow claimed for himself less than a year after being isekai'd here. Less than a year he's been here? I guess that really puts into perspective of how long we've actually been here, huh? Rimuru as well. So much things have happened, but for Masayuki it's been less than a year and he's created this much of a brand for himself. How then did Masayuki end up like this? Well, it all began with her. Oh. I can't really tell you her significance. Primordial Blue? Based on her. Primor I, I don't. She kind of looks like Rimuru from this angle with longer hair. I don't know. Who the hell is this? Her appearance and the way the novel described her, I believe her presence here wasn't just coincidence. Huh. The timing is just far too convenient. This was, however, when Masayuki was 16 years old, though, so after recently being accepted into a fairly competitive high school, he was currently in the process of reinventing himself. Though already somewhat popular, he dyed his hair blonde and kept his passion for anime and manga secret. He also dyed his eyebrows blonde then. I thought this is just his natural hair. But like, the blonde eyebrows too bro, he bleached that shit. Yeah, Masayuki is apparently a super hardcore otaku. So is pretty much every Japanese person that's shown up into the Tensor world. Minus Hinata, I guess. A probable explanation to why he wasn't phased when first getting isekai'd. I wouldn't say Masayuki was particularly different from any other high school student though, but he was the type to- Yo, is that the blue hair girl again? Right over here? I don't know because god damn bro, who is she? Other high school student though, but he was the type to have a disaster preparedness kit. A small emergency box with <laughs> three days rations and a Swiss army knife. Unfortunately, he didn't hmm. have it here now, but it does indicate the level of caution he uses when approaching things. Fast forward to his encounter with Jinrai, and this would be where Masayuki would unlock Chosen One. 
One of the rarest unique skills that one could ever come across says the power it bestowed was almost up there at the same level as ultimate skills. It's bullshit, man. I mean, at the very least, it was equivalent to absolute severance and unlimited imprisonment. Two skills we know from episode 1 are capable of affecting true dragons. If you've watched my video explaining dragons, then you'd know that this is an impressive feat not so easily accomplished. To further explain what Chosen One does though, its complete offering is broken down into four main smaller skills. Basically, it just makes his subordinates always crit hit. They just become so OP, and Masayuki is deemed the hero, and according to the script, the hero will just always find a way to be in a favorable position, so he doesn't really have to do anything, and everything seemingly just solves itself. There's heroic aura and heroic compensation, then heroic charm and heroic action. Heroic, 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 heroic. To make Masayuki a hero, and that in turn makes it as if his life is on autopilot. So, heroic aura is just like Demon Lord's hockey, since they both exert an overwhelming presence capable of stunning those who are weaker. Yo, what about the elven hockey that we saw in the most recent episode with Elnicia? Heroic aura isn't as lethal, though, since those exposed. Gazel has no business looking this fucking cool. I'm still not taking you Gazel fanboy seriously, bro. There's always like two or three people that's always in my videos saying, Yeah, bro, Gazel strong as Hinata. God, don't underestimate big bro Gazel, bro. The dwarf hero is so strong and powerful. And I'm like, is he really though? Is he actually really or are you guys glazing? Only become awestruck by it. It makes them eager to take orders from Masayuki. Heroic comp like, I refuse to believe this motherfucker can take Melt Slash. No way! You telling me this dude can fucking beat Melt Slash? I, no, I mean, the people, they say he's, he's like tying Hinata or something, right? I think that's the comment. It's like, yeah, they're like roughly on equal levels. And I'm like, really, bro? Compensation is what grants Masayuki his luck. And in addition to making things work in his favor pretty much all the time, that luck extends to his attacks as well. It ensures every hit he gives is a critical one. I don't know exactly what it means to be a crit hit in Tensura, because obviously a crit hit, you're just doing a two times multiplier, right? But in the show of Tensura, is that also the same thing? This also applies to his companions too, so whenever they attack, they too are hitting for crits as well. It's like letting both you and your party roll nat 20 all the time. OP. Heroic compensation also makes anything Masayuki says be perceived as positive too, so- That's right, and everyone does mental gymnastics and does tricks off of Masayuki's dick, just glaze and be like, Oh my god, why did he just surrender? Why would Hiro Masayuki give up the grand champion title in this tournament? Could it be that he's scared of Rimuru? No, no! He must be doing Rimuru a favor, cause now he's giving Rimuru time to prepare. Masayuki is so gracious and humble that he didn't want to embarrass Demon Lord Rimuru in his own nation. Oh my god! Whenever faced in some sort of conflict, he can usually de-escalate it through conversation alone. He doesn't even need to have charisma since the words he says will automatically be perceived as amazing. Yeah, and that's why I probably love Masayuki's power so much. Because this is the type of Isika power that I think about. I don't think about going into a fantasy world and being a Fucking Reinhardt from ReZero, right? I don't think about power fantasy like that, where I have ultimate strength. I think it's way more funnier when you can just solve everything by yapping alone. Just, just somehow everything works in your favor by being able to convince people. And this power is just an absolute cheat at doing that. And there's a new Isekai coming up pretty soon for fall 2024 in about less than a month, where it's like an Isekai where the main character is just yapping, right? That's amazing. Moving on to Heroic Charm, this stirs the hearts of those who watch him, both reducing their fear and- Yeah, fucking children too, bro! ...stimulating their bravery. It automatically makes anyone who sees him instantly trust him then want to follow him. Crazy. It's an effect that also applies to those he beats in battle too. So even if there was someone trying to fight him, the only outcome after would be them trying Friendship. to become his companion. Chosen One would somehow find a way to make Masayuki win, then Heroic Charm would convert them into one of his faithful. And then they get to crit all the time too. If Masayuki was serious about building an empire for himself, imagine if Yuki had this power, bro. Not Masayuki. Fucking terrifying. Because if he has sinister thoughts, if he had any sort of ambitions, he could just dominate the world. Now, it's just a unique skill, not an ultimate. But think about 
the amount of allies, the fucking armies that he could amass, and what kind of powers those armies would then have due to Chosen One. Lastly, we have heroic action, which, as you may have guessed, ensures every move he makes serves as steps towards becoming a champion. Regardless of how minor a move it is, it'll always end up being perceived as amazing. Kind of like how it is with Ainz and his subordinates. Okay. So, all this was given to Masayuki on day one, but given his lack of understanding of how the world worked, he remained oblivious to the fact that he had unlocked such power. He had just received one of the most fearsome uniques anyone in the world could possibly possess, yet was none the wiser as to what it was truly capable of. No, instead he was just forced onto the path of the hero. So he has no idea about his powers? Really? Still? One from which he couldn't escape even if he wanted to. No, he is aware, right? At this point, he is aware that everything just works for his favor, right? He did try and explain away all these misunderstandings, but the more he tried, the more others just came to their own assumptions. Like, when he first tried to deny being a hero to Jinrai, Jinrai instead perceived it as him just trying to keep it secret. I'm not the hero. Please. Please. I am not the chosen one. Ah, oh, I understand. The chosen one wants to keep a low profile. Okay. Alright, buddy. I see you. He figured Masayuki had just- Like, this power is so fucking funny. Because, like, even if you denounce yourself as the hero, if you say some shit like, oh, I don't want to be the hero, like, I am not the hero, but then other people will be like, that's what the prophecy says. The prophecy stated that the hero would be so humble and would denounce himself. Oh my god, this must be the one. Just recently revived, then took him to the free guild where he'd meet Yuki and Wait. it is him just trying to keep it secret. He figured Masayuki had just recently revived, then okay. took him to the free guild where he'd meet Yuki and the others. Eventually, he'd decided not to protest against those who called him a hero, but that just gave rise to the growing legend people were spreading about him. Now, it was after recruiting the American Bernie that the three of them joined American. together to become adventurers, resulting in the formation of Team Lightspeed. Individually, they weren't particularly skilled, but with the help of heroic compensation, those buffs made Jinrai and Bernie stronger. How strong? You see, whereas Jinrai was usually the upper C rank, with Masayuki, he was potentially at the A rank. Okay. The enhancements heroic compensation gave them were not to be understated, especially when they were fighting as a team together. Of course, anything they did was all treated as Masayuki's sole accomplishment, so while at first they did start out as Team Lightspeed, eventually Masayuki inadvertently claimed the title of Lightspeed for himself, an epithet that only spread as he became the victor of several battle tournaments. Several he did actually fight anyone, but the way his opponents always gave up and begged for mercy made the crowd assume he'd just hit them with one of his light speed attacks. Yeah, or the one time where Gopta did the fusion and run ran at Masayuki, and he 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 got a stadium out because he couldn't control his strength, and everyone was like, "What just happened?" And one dude's like, "Oh, I see, air throw, invisible air throw. We couldn't see anything." Because the technique is so powerful and mysterious. Yes, air throw. Yeah, that's what happened for sure, bro. <laughs> and like everyone plays into it. Is there nobody that would not play into it? Like surely Elmicia, Luminous, any other, Gazelle even, Hinata, like these people know something else is up, right? But we don't get to see it from their perspective. We only see from like the audience, the masses, right? The average person, not these godlike figures. These godlike figures don't believe in that bullshit, right? It became fuel to a fire Masayuki couldn't put out. The spread of his accomplishments were just too far gone now. Of course, this was all thanks to Chosen One, since the skills making him a hero were active all the time. They That's the crazy shit too, right? It's, it's not a fucking manual skill. It's just a passive that's on 24-7. For passives impossible to resist unless you had a unique skill of your own. It's not like Masayuki could even turn it off since unfortunately for him, he didn't know how to. So, so you could turn it off. While at first such accomplishments were troublesome to the identity he was trying to make, over time he found it was easier to just accept being the Embrace hero. it. With Chosen One being this prominent part of his life now, it was far easier to just go with the flow than fight against it. Oh, he has like a shield too? I only saw the sword before. Obviously, he wasn't confident in anything he did, but he could at least pretend to live up to the expectations the people around him created for him. Yeah, our fucking student, this girl, I forgot her name. 
I only know, remember Chloe. This this girl though, she is folded for Masayuki. I don't think Chloe believes the bullshit though. Chloe seems very skeptical. She sees the truth. This brings us now to Rimuru's first meeting with Masayuki, which, as we saw, didn't go to impress Rimuru. He could tell Masayuki was an otherworlder due to his faint heroic aura, but rather than intimidating, it was barely noticeable. Mm. His anxious demeanor also made Rimuru second guess whether he was truly powerful or not, but after remembering how he was the one who- And Masayuki himself is not truly powerful, right? I don't think so. That's what I want to know. Like, without Chosen One just always helping him out, is he competent in swordsmanship? But after remembering how he was the one who took down Orthrus, such a feat wasn't something one could easily bluff their way through. His behavior and accomplishments were just so very contradicting to each other, enough to make Rimuru genuinely confused as to who he was dealing with. That's when Yuki would mention he too was curious as to Masayuki's power, since while he did know of Masayuki's accomplishments as well, he also had never seen him fight before. No one he has. He only knew of his reputation of never losing against a monster before. This was actually a topic more serious than the anime made it seem, since an entire meeting was cut focusing specifically on Masayuki. What? Everybody? We had an exec meeting? Just to talk about how to deal with Masayuki, bro? That would have been amazing just to glaze him more and build him up. You see, it was late at night, right after the banquet, and Rimuru was holding an impromptu- Jesus, that's a long table! Event. He wanted to ask if anyone would be willing to join the battle tournament. So, as an open invitation to pretty much everyone, it had garnered the interest of not just Benimaru, Shion, and Diablo, but Elite also four. Geld, Soei, and even Hakuro. Of course, we already know why those first three couldn't compete, but the others also had valid reasons too. Like, for Soei, participation just wasn't possible. As the man in charge of running surveillance, he wouldn't be able to compete while at the same time keep track of everyone. Not okay. to mention it didn't make sense for Tempest's number one covert agent to put himself in public like that. Okay. Fortunately, Rimuru did have something- I guess I never really understood what Soei was doing behind the scenes, but he is. Mr. Security, Mr. Survey, so, uh, alright, you, you do your thing, so it behind the scenes. Else in mind for him, as this would be where he would promote him to the head of the Oniwaban, Tempest's equivalent of the CIA, serving oh? as the intelligence group in charge of all spy operations. Oniwaban, okay, wait, I didn't know, it would have been cool to see this group be recognized, but it's basically Tempest like CIA then, huh? Secret forces, secret intelligence forces. Serving as the intelligence group in charge of all spy operations. Cool. It was a group named after an old secret agency from the samurai era. This would be the new- What is this guy doing? What is happening here? He's underneath the staircase. Is this supposed to be ninja-like? Is this art supposed to tell me that by this guy hiding beneath the staircase, he's being secretive? And this is peak fucking surveillance and like, this is fine? <laughs> he, he's just an old fucking man just stuck in the fucking behind the stairs, he can't get out, bro! This would be the new faction Soei was in charge of, and his own personal team would be known as the Kuriyami. Oh. Of course, all this was just an excuse to get him not to participate too, since just like Shion, Diablo, and Benimaru, he too was way too strong for the tournament. It was an excuse Rimuru pre-planned right alongside the Elite Four. Shtenno, or Heavenly Kings, but sounds like Soei's role and the group that's created is just all bullshit, <laughs> just to fucking <laughs> make people busy. This was another ceremonial title not entirely important, but cool sounding enough to make the three of them think it was. Yeah, and then the fourth member is Gata. It's just crazy that of our three strongest members in, in, in Jura Tempest under Rimuru, <laughs> Gopta then is the fourth member. I love it. Benimaru was designated their leader since, as we've seen before, he's General. the sole person Rimuru deems capable of taking over for him. It's not like he'll actually have to do anything, but the position of being leader was enough to get him on board with it. Yeah, I mean, I think that Diablo is the strongest of the three here, but in terms of leadership, probably Benny makes sense. I mean, he has like the unique skill, sorry. He got that gift now, right, too, right? He's got that like um, general or whatever it is that lets him just be 
best strategist leader in a war. Like, you saw that shit against Clayman. It wasn't even a fucking battle. <laughs> like, he just... It was just so easy. His leadership, everything was perfect. The other two accepted their lesser positions as a challenge, while the vacant number four spot was declared available to anyone who wanted to compete for it. Go. The obvious choice was, of course, Hakuro, but no, he unfortunately Gata. was already busy that day. Due to an already planned date with Momoji, Rimuru knew he wouldn't Aww. be able to. So, as much as he wanted to see Hakuro gauge the talents of- That would have been nice to see. Like a little slice of life moment with Hakuro and his daughter just hanging out around and eating something. Just like 10 seconds, bro. Just give me something. Gauge the talents of Masayuki, Rimuru unfortunately had to settle for someone else. This left only Gel to Gopta and Ranga, who, as we know, are the All ones that in. did end up competing. That's right. Ranga wasn't able to on his own, but after Summon. a bit of craftiness on his part, he did somehow find himself as part of it. The other two were given buys straight to the quarterfinals, while the 300 other entrants needed to compete in a battle royale Bald. to join them. All 300 were split into six massive... Is this Eminence in Shadow? This is Eminence in Shadow tournament arc, right? Groups of 50 then told to fight in- I'm pretty sure this is Eminence in Shadow. It is, right? It's the Goldie arc, right? I love- <laughs> That arc was fucking amazing, Monday, man. Until only one was left standing. It was the fastest way of determining- Monday, man! <laughs> one that saw entrance- Ha <laughs> Oh shit! What's this bald guy's name? This guy was hilarious because they show up in season two later and get shit on, bro. <laughs> and then the fucking sneezing and the neck crack. Neck crack. Neck crack. And then they actually tried that shit. That shit was. Yeah, Quinton. That's his name. Quinton. <laughs> Shouldn't be this funny, but I love that arc. It was fucking just. Oh, just amazing. It's from all sorts of people. Lastly, Diablo was assigned as the ref, since in addition to seeming like an unbiased party who could judge fairly, he was also in good standing with the press. Okay. So, by placing a familiar face as the officiator, the whole tournament was likely to be received in a more positive light. It was the final order Rimuru gave before sending everyone off for the night. This brings us now to the day of the tournament, which was packed to capacity due to no small effort from Yomi. Bald. He had somehow managed to fill each and every one of the 50,000 seats <gasps> available. Oh my god. This was partly How? due to the accessibility of it all, but mostly a huge testament to the capabilities of him. Now, as for what I mean- Mjolnir, just god merchant, god marketer, god salesman. Mjolnir, surprised how much- I mean, I'm not sure how much screen time or uh, love they'll show for this character after this arc, but- since this arc does handle a lot of logistics and making money and business, stuff like that, he is really popping off this arc. Now, as for what I mean when I say the Coliseum is accessible, well, Rimuru had made it so that pretty much everyone could watch. Easy to get in? Regardless of whether you were poor or rich, the tiered seating of the stadium meant there was a spot for everyone. <laughs> Basically, the closer you are to the... To the contestants, the more expensive the seats. It opened up seats to those who normally wouldn't ever be able to watch a show like this. This is a huge contrast to the tournaments in Inglesia, since to see one there, you had Super to be expensive. Rich. You see, whereas only the wealthy were allowed to watch there, not only could the common folk be in the stadium in Tempest, but the magically created screens meant that everyone had a prime view. Yeah, the TV screens. The whole thing was a massive boost in PR for Tempest as a whole. As for the arena within the stadium, Everything was built to withstand even the most intense of fights. Whereas regular rock was around 300 times as solid as concrete, Rimuru had gone and used magically infused rock. Oh. He imbued magicules into the very foundation, enhancing its hardness to be over 10,000 times that of concrete. Combine this with multiple layers extending 6 feet deep, and what Rimuru had built was effectively more durable than a nuclear shelter. Uh, okay. It could easily resist the most powerful of both physical and magical attacks. Now, as for the- I didn't realize how rigid the buildings really were, but, I mean, there was a whole entire episode working with that goblin guy with the hammer there, you know, talking about exactly how we're gonna build this shit, but, alright, nuclear bunker, more rigid. ...than a nuclear shelter. It could easily resist the most powerful of both physical and magical attacks. Now, as for the measures Rimuru implemented to protect the audience. To now wait a minute. 
Wait a minute. Could our Nobel, Nobel Prize experiment work here? What was the idea? Why would a potion be able to heal a sword? Because that sword was infused with magicules, and magicules you could treat as radiation, some sort of mutation, making inorganic substances somehow mutate into forms that can now be healed with potions. These are magicule infused rocks. If they happen to break, could you not pour the potion? And then it would heal according to that theory, right? Maybe? Warriors for clear she could easily resist the most powerful of both physical and magical attacks. Now, as for the measures Rimuru implemented to protect the audience, two magical barriers were set in place around them. One blocked magicules from getting in or out, while the other was pretty much a portable version of Uriel. Should an ability seem like it was going to hit the audience, then Rimuru could remotely trigger Uriel's absolute defense to negate it. OP. It ensured no matter what happened, nothing would affect the audience. This brings us now to the tournament itself, which is something I think I'm gonna save until it's finally done next episode. Oh shit! Okay, we're gonna get a part two to this? I am so, and I was getting worried because like, bros talked about everything but the fucking tournament fight so far, but I'm down. Unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna see Masayuki lift a finger, but if anyone can do it, then maybe. Gotta, maybe. It's just chosen one is so crazy powerful. Unless you have a unique skill stronger or an ultimate skill yourself, mm, exactly. you're probably not going to remain unaffected by it like how Rimuru was. Imagine the first time Masayuki goes up against an ultimate skill that overrides his chosen one. The world, the voice of the world realizes how like the hero needs a buff right now and then evolves the unique skill into an ultimate skill. I could see that happen. 100% can see that happening. It's just like, he's supposed to be the hero. What do you mean he's going to lose to an ultimate skill from a demon lord? No, 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 no. Let's buff him up right now. He needs to be heroic. And yeah, I, I could totally see that happening. So perhaps Gopta could come out clutch and win the tournament. But with the way things are going, I highly doubt it. Anyway. That's pretty much all that I got for you today. All right. If you liked what you saw and want to see more, then you know what to do. Like the video. Go check out his channel. Here is the link. And Tensura tournament arc. It's not really a tournament arc, right? It's just the festivals and tournaments are part of it. This has been a delight. It's been a long time in the making. Finally, everything has come together. And we already know that Gopta wins, but I really enjoy the tournament stuff. And now we head into the labyrinth to see what's going to happen as we wrap up the season but that's it from me i will see you in the part two of this tournament video